the end result is the customers being happy and smiling. Um, you know, I think that's what I love doing, um, what I do. People enjoying the food, telling us how great it is, you know. Yeah, and that's all we want. We just want people to be happy at the end of the day and be able to have good food. This is The Crackling. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Feeding a lot of people at a high standard takes a special person and a big team. But for Jason Chan, it's become his forte as the young chef continues to push the limits on what's possible when you set your mind to it. Jason, you are a busy man. Yes, I sure am, Anthony, and welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you're doing amazing things out there in um, Bankstown in, in Sydney. Tell us a little bit about sort of all the different operations that you're running. Um, yeah, I've got um, Canton Kitchen, which is my Southeast Asian or modern Asian restaurant, if you like to call that. Um, uh, opened up a little uh, sushi joint. So it's more like a takeaway, grab and go. Um, that one's called Miso Oishi. Um, yeah, I just want to do something different um, to push my boundaries. Um, then I've got my dumping factory, which is... Um, situated in uh, Chipping Norton, so yeah. The Dumpling Factory is something that um, you mentioned to caught up briefly in Sydney recently and it sounded much bigger than you're sort of leading on at the moment. Tell us a bit about how that all started. Um, I think it all started with like my, my grandparents taking me to Yamcha all the time and look, I, I was like, oh, you know, I get to eat all the time. I go, I want these are that hard to make. So um, yeah. Got a group of friends and said, you know what, let's 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 do this. Let's try and you know we we opened up a little dumpling factory and yeah, and now we make dumplings, um, you know, for a living on the side and yeah, and yeah, we supply to a few restaurants and all that. So yeah, tell us a little bit about sort of what you're making there and does pork feature quite a lot in the dumplings there? Yeah, it definitely does. Um, pork and prawn shoe, my um, a very Cantonese classic um, dumpling. Um, yeah, so that's one of our uh, big sellers. We've got like your pork shell um, and we've got the pork and cabbage pan fried dumplings. So yeah, big sellers. You mentioned um, your love of yum char and that sort of took you down that road. D- tell us about sort of, were there any challenges in sort of working out how to make these along the way? Tell us about that process and sort of the successes you had. Oh, definitely. Like, um we we started learning off a couple of um, very um, old school and very uh, what's the word um, dumpling chefs that have been in the industry for a very long time, and we were very fortunate to have them on board to help us um, grow. Um, I think they've got their techniques and we've got ours, so we adapted to their one. But after a while, we we're like, oh, I don't think this is feasible, you know. Um, we, we need to like change things around to, to make it more I think feasible for people now and um, yeah we did a few changes but look we we still get a lot of customers that come to us and say that oh it's not traditional it's um, you know it's different you know, I said yeah of course it is you know like we we've got our own ways of, of making it and you know still still giving you guys the quality well uh, Shalom Bao, the soup dumplings are a um, very popular sort of dumpling tell us how you make those Oh, shut on bow. Um, so we use uh, long process, but um, we use um, two different cuts of uh, pork. So we use pork belly and pork neck. Um, so pork belly, you know, obviously a bit more fattier. Uh, we combine it together um, to give it a bit more richness to it. Um, yeah, and basically cabbage. We put a bit of cabbage inside. Then we make a a broth from. We use pork skin and pork to make a broth out of it. Um, and then we turn it into a jelly. Um, we season it with a lot of like ginger, shallot to give it a lot of flavor. What's it been like for you, you know, running these uh, big restaurants, which we'll get to shortly, but having this sort of side hustle, which has become a big hustle, has it been hard to manage everything? Yeah, look, um, everyone knows that COVID didn't really help. Um, but look, finding staff is also very hard now. Um, you know, with an increase in cost and everything, and it's um, uh, how do you say it? Um, I wouldn't say it's crippled the industry, but it's definitely had you know, it's 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 done its damage. Um, but you know, every day we we think about how we can you know fix this and solve this. But it's it's been a constant challenge. But you know, we're we're getting there. I think we we will. Well, the that sort of ability to sort of um, 
change your operations and do multiple things has, has been a real benefit to people out of this experience and you're one of them you know you're supplying restaurants now with products as well as running restaurants do you have a different insight into running your own restaurant now that you're supplying restaurants with a with a different product yeah look uh, we, we try to make everything affordable um because it works both ways um you know having a side hustle with the dumpling place i think it it um I think it transformed us instead of being like, you know, people opening restaurants. I'm like, you know, if we can supply it and cut our cost and, you know, just be behind a, a, a factory and not have uh, front of house staff and all these other outgoings. And if we can supply to restaurants at an affordable price, then, you know, they can survive as well and have good products. And, and you know, we've got another business on the side to, to help with our other businesses. Yeah, totally. Well, I want to get into sort of what you're doing there, particularly with Canton Kitchen sort of shortly, but well, take us back to when you were young. What, what sort of role did food play for you and your family growing up? Oh, big role. My parents were in the restaurant industry and yeah, and, and, and growing up, um, you know, every day being at their restaurants and, you know, seeing the hustle and you sort of, you sort of appreciate it and yeah, like it's – yeah, I think it's just bred in me now, but. <laughs> Was there any sort of pork dishes that you remember from when you were young from your parents' restaurants that sort of you have fond memories of? Of course. How can you not remember a crispy pork belly? Silio, Silio is like – it's – I don't know. It's I think it's the godfather of all pork, you know. You, you, you taste the crackling and, like, you know, how can you forget your first bite of pork crackling? <laughs> You can't go back. Yeah, I'm, I uh, have a similar addiction. Suyuk is incredible. Tell us about the process of making that. Uh, um, very long process. I mean, look, pork belly. Um, we, you know, we, we have to blanch it. Um, we're going to put salt on top to dry it out for three, four hours. Um, after that, we scrape all the salt off. Then we marinate um, the bottom of the pork belly. Um, for another 24 hours um, and then we we take it out again then we use those big um, what do you call those things again um, those wooden like needle type things that's got like 50 needles on them uh, you get two of those and you know you just keep stabbing them and until you puncture the skin but not completely so it doesn't penetrate too too insane then you get all those air bubbles when you sort of roast it um, yeah and then yeah, and then we we roast it, and yeah, it's about what two day two day process to get that one up. Yeah, you mentioned that your parents had a restaurant uh, growing up. When did you first sort of get an inkling that that might be a career for you? And did your parents try to lure you away from running restaurants? Yeah, never, never. I never thought I would be in the restaurant industry. Like never, not 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 once. <laughs> um, yeah, and no, I'm serious. Like I was like, oh no, nah, can't do this. You know, you guys smell every day when you come home. I, I ain't doing that, mate. I, no way. Um, and, and like my mum and dad did say, like you know, um, you know, look, we don't want you doing this. It's it's not a, um, it's not a. I think for Asians, I think they say, you know, working uh, in the hospitality or restaurant industry, it's not something that's a good profession. That's what they always say to me. And they say, oh, why don't you do something else? And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I can, but you know, yeah. So that's why I never, never did it. But I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your first steps into the industry. How did it all start? Um, looking for a side gig, um, you know, while I was working, I wanted to look for a bit more cash on the side. Um, you know, when you're young, you want to go out, and you never had money. I was like, yeah, man, I, I need to do something. So um, yeah, I, I found this job online um, at a Thai restaurant in Neutral Bay. And um, I went there after work and, yeah, the owner said to me, look, do you know how to cook? I said, nope. He goes, oh, <laughs> like, what can you do? I said, oh, probably nothing, but I just wanted, you know, extra cash on the side. And I actually went there and I actually enjoyed it the first night. Um, I was there for four hours and, yeah, she goes, oh, you're doing pretty well. I said, oh, am I? I said, no, I've done nothing so far, but we'll walk in the kitchen and, and take a few vegetables out. But, yeah, and then I actually enjoyed it. Um, um, yeah, and then she started teaching me how to um, use the wax on my fourth, I think, third or fourth shift. Yeah, yeah, and I actually enjoyed it. I think this is this is fun because seeing my dad do it, and then but he never taught me because he never wanted me to do it. 
But this lady was like, you know, I can show you. I said, yeah, why not? So that's how it all started. Was there any dishes that you remember from that time in, in the Thai restaurant? Yeah, Pad Thai. <laughs> yeah, first noodle dish. They're, they're, yeah, Thai, yeah, national dish. And then it's like uh, Pad Thai. I, I said, no way. But yeah, she taught me. You've worked at some pretty incredible restaurants in your time before um, running your own. But what, what were the sort of really important moments and venues and people for you as you started to build your career? Um, well, I think every venue had that mentor there. There was always one person that would take you under their wings and, and be like, look, you know what? Um, you know, we see potential in you. Um, you know, we want to, we want you to grow and, you know, so look, I, there's no specific venue or, or person that's, that's, um, you know, done more than another. I think everyone's pretty equal and I've learned uh, amazing things off every venue that I've worked at and I, I appreciate everything. And that's, that's how I got into my own restaurants from all the experiences that I've been at all these other great, amazing venues. Tell us about some of them. What's been some of the venues that you have worked at? Um, I worked at Queen Chow Enmore, um, Maribel. So that was my um, one of my first head chef uh, gigs. Um, I worked at Super Normal in Melbourne. Um, I was at China Diner. Then I was at Panama Dining. So I was at a few few great restaurants. And then um, over my years with Maribel, I was at a couple of the other venues as well. So yeah, it was great learning experience. It's amazing. There's some um, pretty incredible venues there. Did did pork feature on those menus? Is there any sort of standout dishes from your time in those restaurants that you can tell us about? Yeah, um, let's say well, well Queen Chow and more. That was a great menu. Um, you know, we sweet and sour pork was always um, going to be a staple. Um, you know, being an Asian restaurant, um, you know, we did our version of it. You know, I think it had lotus root and all that inside, which you don't see in a lot of sweet and sour porks. But it was a pickled lotus fruit, um, like pineapple and, and all that stuff. So, yeah, it was a little bit different, but people accepted it. So it was our version of it. Queen Chow uh, in, in Enmore there was a very different venue. It was a pub that Maryvale transformed. Tell us about sort of how you got that gig and, and the venue and what it was like. Um, I was in Melbourne um, during that time, and I think we wanted to move back from Melbourne to, to Sydney. And, um, yeah, I saw, I saw a gig come up and – they were looking for a head chef, but they were still building the place, I think it was. And, yeah, I applied for the job and um, they said to me, look, you know, um, we'll do an interview over the phone. And I said, you know what, no, I'll just fly in. And I'll see you guys instead. I think it's a lot easier. So I think um, a bit of um, – uh, I was I was pretty keen. So I think that's, that's what got me by maybe the job. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. What was it like doing sort of what you're doing? You're on the first floor of of the of the yes. pub. There was it was it something different for you? How did it work? Yeah, it was it was really different because there was two levels, and um, you know, first time running a two level restaurant, and you know, you know, obviously all Maryvale venues um always do really well. Um, it was quite busy as well. Um, you know, but we had a very strong team. Um, but yeah, it was just busy every single night it was it doesn't stop <laughs> how did you get the gig at canton kitchen um i opened up a restaurant in castle craig so that was um there in castle craig so uh, our lease was up so we um you know we we got approached by banks on sports to see if we wanted to um open up uh, a canton kitchen in in, uh, in bankstown so that's where it all started and then yeah, i said you know why not went in had a look at the club and i was like man this is a no-brainer <laughs> how, how how different was it for you working in that sort of club environment and bringing in that sort of standalone restaurant mentality um Look, it's there's pros and cons to it. Um, I think you know, being inside a club, you know, you've got that foot traffic, and 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 you know, people know that there's a restaurant inside. But um, also, you know, obviously, people expect a different product um, because you're inside a club. But you know, changing that mentality was hard. But you know, three and a half years in there, you know, I think we've done pretty well and we've survived and we've changed a lot of people's, um, you know, uh, what, what what they think of what food should be inside a club. What's important for you in regards to pork? Um, what do you look for, you know, for the for the dishes that you make? What do you need from the pork? That you make? Best quality. 
<laughs> best quality, but also look, um, depending on what type of dish we're making, um, you know, different cuts and making sure that, um, you know, like it, it's, it's a good quality. Like we, we don't want to just be, you know, um, buying, you know, something that's not great, but we want to also promote it as well. You know, like we want to show people, you know, there's a lot of different cuts you can use. So take us through the menu there at Canton Kitchen. How, how does pork weave through the menu? What's What sort of dishes do you uh, use it for and how versatile is it? Oh, it's super versatile. So we use a lot of cuts actually. Um, so for our sweet and sour pork, which is one of our, our uh, main sellers, we use pork um, pork neck for it. So, you know, it's, it's got a great um, amount of, you know, leanness to it, but it's also got fat, a little bit of fat. So it's it's not as dry when you make our sweet and sour pork. Our signature dish, um, crispy master style pork belly with apple and mint. Um, that one, signature dish, crispy pork belly. We cook it uh, in master stock for like, I think, six to eight hours. Take it out, press it overnight. Yeah, and... And then we deep fry it nice and crispy and we make this Thai chili caramel. So that's an amazing dish. Um, we use, I mean, this this cut's probably not as um, known to a lot of people, but we use pork chow as well. Um, we use pork chow for our skewers. So we've got a pork chow skewer. Um, and we put a nice lemongrass coconut dressing on top. Wow. Um, yeah. What's the secret to cooking the pork chow there? Oh, we – look, to us, we, we marinate it um, for 24 hours. Um, and then what we do is look, we, we've got an amazing grill there. So we just grill it. We, we lightly grilled. Um, you know, people like to cook it till it's completely, like, dry and, you know, oh, it's it's the jowl. Are you sure you can eat it if it's a little bit pink? Of course you can, you know. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we don't cook it too much. We cook it to about 80%, let it rest, and then we serve it. So – Nice and juicy. I noticed you also got uh, pork ribs on on the menu, which is a bit of a favourite of ours and, and our house. But how do you do yours? Uh, we make that into our pork char siu. So instead of yeah, so instead of using your pork um, your pork your pork neck for your char siu, we use pork ribs. Um, like you said, everyone loves pork ribs. Um, that's a long process. We we marinate it with our. Um, special dry rub um, for three hours. We let it sit. Then we use our, our wet rub, um, which is, you know, it consists of like uh, hoisin and um, five spice and uh, probably another 13 ingredients that I'm not going to tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> secrets. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Um, <laughs> secrets. Um, and then, yeah, we let it sit 24 hours overnight. Um and then when we roast it, like we roast it at 220 degrees, I think for about maybe 15 minutes. And then we take it out, um, honey glaze it or what you say, maltose glaze it. Um, and then we roast it for another, I think it's for another maybe 13 to 14 minutes on 180 degrees. It comes out amazing. You've got that little bit of um, char on the sides of the of the ribs. And it's, yeah, it's amazing. Like it's char seal, but on a pork rib. That sounds incredible. There's so many steps to these different pork dishes, and some of them take days. How how do you train you know your your new staff or new kitchen staff these incredible techniques? Uh, I don't tell them it takes days, so they so they, so they accept the job first. <laughs> so they take on the gig. Yeah, I'll work here, um, and then uh, and then after I tell them it takes about three days, and like oh my god, what did I sign up for? Um, but no, you look. It's. I think they, they love learning different processes. Um, you know, instead of the run of the meal, oh yeah, look, um, there's a recipe, marinate it for two hours and then use it. But I think there's a step to everything that we do, and I think the kids appreciate it because we tell them that you know it's not from me; it's actually from our elders. You know, people that have been doing this many many years before us, and you know, we're we're trying to bring on bring the tradition. Um, also, I should say keep the tradition. And, you know, hopefully, you know, you guys can, you know, pass it on to your generation. So is it is it hard striking that balance between sort of, you know, moving forward and with the cuisine and trying new things, but maintaining that tradition as well? Is it get hard getting that balance? Right. Yeah, it, it definitely is. But um, look, we, we, you know, I, I don't want to lose the tradition because you, you – if people start doing, I think oh, this is my 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 opinion anyway. But if if people start 
you know, going, oh, no, let's not do it this way. Let's just do it our way. Then, you know, after, I don't know, 20, 30 years, it's like, well, is there even a tradition to this? Oh, no, it's not. This is being done and, and you sort of lose the authenticity in it. Like, it just, yeah. What's, what's things like for you now? You're doing, you know, multiple venues and you've got the incredible dumpling factory as well. How are you seeing things moving forward? Where, do you, where would you like to take things? Well, uh, I, look, I hope the industry does get better and I'm pretty sure it will. Um, you know, look, every day, um, you know, we, we hope that things do change and we, we fight for it. Um, so, look, in saying, you know, what we think and all that stuff. Look, I'm passionate about what I do. So it's, you know, I have faith in this. So I think, you know, I think it will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> What's next for you? What's next? Um, a holiday, <laughs> a, a long due, overdue holiday, um, you know, a few pinot coladas, Negronis. Um, yeah, I'll come back and, you know, I'll maybe talk to you on the next podcast. <laughs> Well, Jason, you're doing amazing things, not only with um, a hugely successful restaurant there in um, Sydney's suburbs, but also with the Dumpling Factory. Um, What do you love about what you do? Um, I think the end result is the customers being happy and smiling. Um, You know, I think that's what I love doing, um, what I do. People enjoying the food, telling us how great it is, you know, Um, know, especially when people come from – um, let's say, uh, well, like, got a good example. Last night, a customer came in and um, uh, Malaysian, Hong Kong, and I can't remember what the other one was, but they ate our, they actually ate the pork char seal and they said, wow, this is amazing. It's it's so flavorsome. It's, you know, like, it's like what we eat in Hong Kong. And I was like, oh, wow, thank you. Like, and so, you know, stuff like that makes us want to, you know, continue what we're doing. And, yeah, that's all we want. We just want people to be happy at the end of the day and be able to have good food. Well, uh, Jason, I hope you get your holiday very soon. It sounds like you're ready for one. But uh, we've loved having you on The Crackling today to hear part of your story and look forward to hearing more of your success further down the track. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks, thank you for having me today. This is The Crackling, a Deep in the Weeds production in partnership with Porkstar. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we catch up with some of Australia's best chefs and pork producers to discover what makes Australian pork so special.